Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Um, <coughs> Coleric Audio is, is an example of a very early high-tech startup company, uh, and I've, asked, I've been asked to um, give some kind of insight into how the company became established uh, and got going in the first place. Um, just briefly say, the company actually started uh, in the 1950s, it's still going strong today, 60 years later. In that time, it's manufactured microphones of many types, uh, mixing consoles for broadcast, theatre and recording studio use. Uh, there's a huge amount of information I, I, I could cover, but uh, we've only got a limited amount of time, so I'll try and um, not just make it a list of dates and products. Um, so I'm talking, going to talk about from when the company started until it became established as a mainstream manufacturer. Uh, I'm very interested in your in everything you said about engineering, and particularly the uh, uh, because because Colrec was a, an early um, innovator, so much engineering had to be developed ourselves. And uh, one of the things we've got uh, your picture of beautiful engineering at Nutcliffe Mill, we have an RF aniquate chamber, which we uh, designed and built when we when the EMC regulations came in because there was no test house locally that we could use. So we had to develop our own. It's still there and uh, going strong is that. Uh, using techniques that we developed 50 years ago when we had an, aniquate, an audio aniquate chamber uh, for testing microphones. It, it's, all, it's all very similar stuff. Our, our, our we call low frequencies everything from zero to about 100 hertz. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> So, how did it start? Um, <coughs> it was started in the 50s, group of local audio enthusiasts. They were Clem Beaumont, Ken Ellis, Ken Farrow, Howard Smith and Percy Hopwood. <coughs> in this picture, I don't know what we're drinking champagne there, I don't know what we're celebrating. I think we sold a mixer desk to Abra or somebody like that at the time. Um, <coughs> they were all good friends. Ken and Clem were power engineers. Ken Farrow was the, the real founder of the company and the, the driving force behind it. He, he was a power engineer, but he'd studied uh, ad electronics to a very advanced level when he was doing his national service. And uh, he, he was managing director from 1970 until 86. Anyway, this group got together. Uh, they enjoyed listening to music, they built loudspeakers, they built amplifiers uh, so that they had a, a good uh, quality listening experience, but then they needed materials. So they decided that the only way to do it, they couldn't afford to buy anything, uh, so they decided to design and build something. So they built a tape recorder, it uses washing machine motors as the spooling motors, but uh, the capstan motor quite, uh, was quite a, a, a decent quality motor, but... Uh, and stuff salvaged from army surplus down Shude Hill in Manchester at the time. You probably won't remember that, but they used to, they used to go and get all sorts of things down there. Uh, so they built recording studio, and next was a recording studio. This was the early mixer desk uh, in the recording studio. It's quadrant faders that were salvaged from the BBC, and again, a lot of army surplus equipment. And then they tried to make some microphones. Following a, an article in Wireless World in 1956 on capacitor microphone design, um, they had a go at making some microphones. And just, uh, you probably all know all this, but just so you know what a capacitor microphone is. Um, oh, that's, uh, hang on, oh, oh, I've got out of step. I'll come back to capacitor microphones. What they did was, they built a recording studio. That's a disc cutter. They made a disc cutter so they could uh, cut the uh, acetates uh, straight from the uh, tape machine. Uh, and that was the recording studio, which was just around the corner here uh, on Regent Street in 1961. Uh, that's Howard, uh, one of the directors in his Brian Epstein pose uh, with some local band, none of who, none of who ever became famous. Um, then, 
the com they were approached. I don't know exactly how, it, uh, but somebody got hold of somebody through a meeting, and were approached by a company called Ficord. It was a Swiss company, and they had a portable tape recorder that they were trying to sell in the UK. They used biodynamic microphones, but they needed a capacitor microphone, uh, and they commissioned Colrec uh, to make capacitor microphones uh, for them. And <coughs> so I come on to capacitor mics. Now this is the right place to do it. Uh, a capacitor microphone is basically a capacitor which is created uh, with a capsule is a capacitor which is created um, by you have a central part, an insulant around it and then there is a diaphragm over the top of it. The diaphragm is quarter thou mylar film uh, sputtered with aluminium um, to make it conductive and you have a gap um, of approximately uh, 1.2 thou on the front and a gap of 1 thou on the back. Uh, this is charged at 50, we use a maintained polarity condenser which is uh, 50 volts um, which creates the capacitor. The output from that is then fed into an amplifier uh, and uh, the signal is then driven down the cable. The advantage of a capacitor microphone is it's very low noise, it's very low distortion, um, very flat frequency response if you, get it, if you get it right. And because it's got an amplifier, it's capable of driving down a long, low impedance cable, which is essential in professional audio. Uh, it's all right using um, a, a small dynamic microphone if you're feeding 20 feet into an amplifier, but if you've got to feed 100 metres of high capacity cable, you need an amplifier. So a uh, capacitor microphone does that. The problem with building them is that it's actually a very, it's not really an electronic product, it's a mechanical product and uh, it requires to do it successfully and to do it in, vast, in large quantities, it, it requires very expensive precision mechanical engineering machinery which Colwright didn't have. So we had to develop capsule designs uh, that enabled us to make a high performance uh, product um, using ba very basic equipment. Uh, we did that and we achieved it with, with various things. Uh, because of the way a capsule works, it's circular. Um, it has to pick up sound coming from the front. It has to reject sound coming from the back. And the way it does that is by creating an acoustic labyrinth that delays the signal as it goes round via the back so that it's out of phase with the signal arriving from the front. Um, and it has to be very precise to achieve that and it also has to be very precise axially otherwise you get, um, you get all sorts of, of problems cause it. So it's, it's actually quite a difficult product to make but the company, we got on and made it and we got this contract from Ficord and started manufacturing the, um, the products. Um, We also got the contract from Biodynamic. At that time, they sold microphones in the UK. They all had to, when they went faulty, as you know, if you've ever owned a, a ribbon microphone, when you drop it or blow into it, um, that's the end of it. It has to go and have a new ribbon fitted. And they all had to go to Germany, which took eight weeks. Uh, so Biodynamic appointed Calrec as their UK service centre. Um, <coughs> and, uh, and, and so that provided a steady stream of income and, and Ken here was the first person that actually started working for the business. <coughs> then, just as things were building up, Ficord went into liquidation. Uh, so there were a lot of microphones then, um, all built, uh, Ficord mics, and um, so the decision was taken to change the name of the company to uh, Colrec uh, and start manufacturing all microphones. And so that happened. That happened in 1966. By 1969, the company were producing 10 microphones a week. We used to use microphones as a term of currency. Uh, you know, uh, a microphone, you know, so many micro, two microphones a week paid a salary and uh, three microphones a week uh, could buy this piece of equipment and everything worked in microphones. But anyway, when we got up to 10 microphones a week, not me, not me we, when the company got up to 10, uh, the other founder members were able to join full time. And so, that was, the, that was the, that's just making microphone power supplies. Um, 
So a whole range of microphones were developed, um, all for studio use and some for live bands, but mainly studio use. Then, in the 1970s, companies started to make small mixers to complement uh, the microphone. So you've got a very simple mixer here, it's a six-channel uh, mixer. You've got six uh, mic gain controls, that's the coarse gain setting. Uh, that's the rotary fader, and then you've got a master output fader, and a little bit of equalisation, stereo, uh, treble and bass, uh <coughs> and a peak program meter measuring the output. So that goes along with your microphones uh, for doing a very simple mix. But then, whilst um, our sales guy was down at the BBC trying to sell microphones to them, uh, he met a project engineer who was looking for companies to build mixing desks. Up until that point, BBC made all their own mixing desks. Uh, they were typical committee-built products. They were actually very, they were actually pretty good sound-wise. They were, they were well-engineered, but they were over-specified. They were very expensive to make. It took forever to get them uh, designed and built, um, and they were very difficult to maintain. So, they were BBC at that time, in the early 70s, they were planning to launch Radio 3, a stereo FM radio, it was when the first stereo broadcasting was starting, FM. And they needed a new generation of mixer desks, the existing stuff wouldn't do. It had to have a sophisticated level of controls, it had to be light enough to carry into a concert hall, uh, to carry up um, a church tower when you were doing songs of praise. Um, it had to be simple enough to do a, a talks programme, such as Gardner's Question Time, where you have three or four microphones and also be capable of carried into the Albert Hall or the Queen Elizabeth Hall uh, and do a full orchestra. So it had to be a very flexible <coughs> thing. And Colorette were... Um, oh, Colorette, this is it. Colorette were one of two companies who were, who were commissioned to build a prototype run. Um, that was in 1972. It was the year I joined the company straight from college. Um, and we just got the contract to make the prototype run of five sets of this. So you, you had uh, what's called a channels unit with eight audio channels, microphone inputs, EQ, routing, fader, uh, a groups unit, and a master output unit. So you could have anything from eight channels uh, up to a 64 channel unit. At that time, the company, we were building these, <coughs> this is, the, this is uh, upstairs above the studio in Regent Street, we are building them in there, um, but then we got, um, when we got the contract, we moved into Royd Works, which for those of you, I don't know if you, any of you know Hebden Bridge, or if you're all visitors here, but Royd Works is now La Perla restaurant round there. It, um, we moved there in 1972. So this production run, oh, that's Royd Works. That was Royd Works. It was a toffee factory, just a matter of interest. And when Moreland's Biscuits, um, they were called, and they made, they made biscuits and toffee. And when we moved in there, um, the ground floor was covered in toffee, and the only way we could get it off was to get a, a large acetylene torch and a burner torch and, and melt it and scrape it off. Uh, but anyway, I digress. This is a big set. That's a big set of this J series thing, and that's in Royd Works. Uh, <coughs> interestingly, it was the world's. It was the the first um, iron frame building. It's a wrought iron frame building. It was built in the eighteen in about eighteen eighty. Uh, the first uh, steel frame building uh, in the valley. Um, it was a nightmare to maintain because it moved about, um, creating all sorts of gaps. Um, anyhow, it was very successful. We got the main contract uh, after the prototype run, and, and this stuff was built from, or we, carry, we carried on building it from 1973 for about five years, and it was the bedrock of the, of the company's manufacturing in that period. And it became, I mean, the Correct were then invited to build recording, um, stu uh, mixer desks for radio studios as well as the outside broadcasts. 
Having had this success with the radio though, we're keen to get into television. At the time, um, television budgets were much bigger than radio, um, and so we were keen to get into that. But they wouldn't, BBC television and BBC radio were two different organisations uh, that, that resented one another. Uh, and so because we were a supplier to radio, TV didn't like us for that, from that point of view, and they wouldn't, they certainly wouldn't, and radio was small and blah, 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 and TV was very important then. Um, so they wouldn't consider us until we'd made television desks. So we had to think how to do that. So anyhow, Time Tees Television were looking for a mixer desk, and we persuaded them to purchase a console for us uh, by telling them that we supply the BBC. It was almost true. <laughs> they, they thought we meant television. Then once we built a mixer desk for them, which it was, no, that was radio. Um, once we built a mixer desk for them, um, we then told the BBC that we did make television desks. And the BBC, television, BBC TV, thought that was a good idea. So they, um, uh, they went up to Time Tees to look at that. Um, it was a very embarrassing tour around the facility. Uh, where the Time Tees television chief exec explained to the head of BBC TV that he mustn't speak when a red light's on, uh, and then Time Tees managed to mess up making the programme. Uh, but however, it all worked out in the end, and BBC uh, decided that they would actually buy uh, television desks from as well. And so there were a number of products, that's a radio console, that's the actual Time Tees a television mixer desk. I mean, it looks so simple nowadays, but in 1973, boy, it was a sweat to get that to work and to perform properly uh, and to do everything that it needed to do. Um, a number of philosophies for Carl, right? The things that have stood us in good stead. One is audio quality. Mixer desks have to be very low noise. They have to be very uh, low distortion. They have to have very low crosstalk, which is not a problem in most audio applications, but the mixer desk. It's a real problem because if you've got um, a very high sensitivity uh, a channel with a, a, a quiet speaker on, on one channel and next to it you've got somebody playing a trumpet uh, or, or a telephone line coming in, then you've not got to have any crosstalk uh, between the two or you can hear it. All these problems have disappeared in the digital domain. But in the analogue domain, it, it, was quite a, it was quite a problem. Um, <coughs> also, when you've got a large mixer desk and you've got uh, 60 or 80 analogue channels, uh, the residual noise build-up is, is a real problem, so it has to be, it has to be dealt with. Ergonomic design. Um, for live broadcast, which was where Colorex specialised, um, there's a lot going on. It's a very high-pressure working environment. The person who's using the desk has to be able to see what's going on they have to be able to reach all the controls very easily. The controls have to feel right, not just mechanically feel right, but as you're varying something such as a, a tone control or a pan, uh, it, it's audibly got to, to move in a natural way. A lot of things for ergonomic design. Um, it has to be lightweight. Um, these things go in trucks. Um, they have to be... They have to be um, uh, small as possible. Elegant circuit design. To achieve a lot of these things, um, one of the hallmarks of Colorex design was to design circuits with very low current. Uh, you know everything you've been, you've been saying. In the audio world, it's very easy to produce an amplifier that has a low noise performance, that has a low distortion performance, if you pump lots of current into it. If you, take, if you run it at a very low current, it's very difficult to achieve these other, these other things. So that was our skill, producing very low current audio, audio circuitry. Uh, the third advantage of uh, not only the performance, the, the big advantage, once you've got low current things, you can package more of it in a small space. It doesn't get too hot, it doesn't become unreliable, and reliability is one of the key features. Uh, manufacturing quality, it, it has to be said, whatever you build has to be perfect. It's going out into the real world, it's going to get dragged around, thrown in the back of vans. Um, and um, if it goes wrong, everybody gets uh, very upset. And fully featured, it means it's got to have everything on it. 
<coughs> it's got to do everything that, that's needed for program making, customer support. Um, I, I, I needn't go into that. I think everybody knows what that's about these days. But you have to support. In broadcasting, you have to be prepared to support it worldwide if necessary. So, this was the first desk that we made for BBC Television. BBC TV, Lime Grove, <laughs> Studio D. It took us a year to design and build this console, 1975 it was, <coughs> and we took it down to Lime Grove, we installed it. Lime Grove, incidentally, it was the uh, Lime Grove Studios in London, it was where BBC Television moved to. They started off in, Ale the first broadcast was Alexandra Palace, and then they moved to Lime Grove, which was just near Shepherd's Bush. Um, it, was, it was previously the... Um, the studios of the Gaumont Film Corporation. Um, anyway, we installed it and we're in this, we, we went down for the opening night for the programme in this beautiful panelled room, which had previously been the Gaumont Film Court boardroom and we're drinking champagne and everybody was saying what great chaps we were in there. First programme came on, it was the money programme and uh, we all stood there and uh, <coughs> five seconds into the programme the sound went off and uh, it was off for 29 seconds. I haven't forgotten. Nobody ever forgets things like that. Where everybody, the first thing everybody did was look at the watches. So 29 seconds later, the sound came back on. And um, at, the end of, at the end of the programme, we were frog-marched, myself and Ken Farrow were frog-marched up, to, uh, up the, to the control room by the head of BBC Maintenance to find out what had gone wrong with it. What had gone wrong with it is a fuse had blown in one of these modules. Each module had an individual fuse and the fuse had blown. It had blown in the afternoon uh, and they changed it and continued to use that channel even though on a 36 channel desk they were, they were only using three channels but they used one that had blown its fuse in the afternoon. Anyway, the we came back to Hebden Bridge and removed fuses, designed fuses out of the system. To this day, a correct mixer desk doesn't have a fuse anywhere but on the input to the mains power supply. Um, the terrible things are fuses. Um, the console turned out to be extremely reliable. Um, it did over 16 years of very hard service down there. It used to do breakfast television. Uh, they did daytime programs, it did uh, nationwide in an evening, uh, grandstand on a Saturday. It was a very, very, a very good desk and, and it led to us being um, considered as, as the best supplier for BBC TV. Um, that's the desk in the control room. Uh, that's then we're invited to start and do television centre uh, up at White City. Uh, so we did most of the most of the studios in television centre. Many years later, when Lime Grove Studios were being pulled down, the actual the same engineer who'd been involved with the installation rang me up and said, "Do you want to buy your old desk back, Steve?" I said, "Well, no thanks, I don't really." Uh, but uh, but if you're pulling it down, if you're pulling the building down. Could we buy the panel in from that room we were in that night when it all went horribly wrong? And he said, yeah, of course you can. So two of us went down, we stripped it out, and we brought it back, and we fitted it in Nutcliffe Mill. And it's actually the boardroom at Nutcliffe Mill now. <laughs> in 1975, we carried on making microphones, uh, but microphones was pretty much a small-scale business. Again, one of the problems was, well, several problems. The, the one that I mentioned about needing very, very sophisticated machinery to make it w was a problem. Uh, second problem, the ideal way to make um, a capacitor microphone is to use RF techniques. And the best ones, or some of the best ones for for outside work, for working outside, are made by a German company called Sennheiser, who use the capacitor capsule as, as the uh, uh, modulating element uh, in an RF uh, detector. So you don't have any problems with moisture, you don't have any problems with heat and things like that. So it does make it a lot simpler, but that was patented, so we couldn't actually do that. And increasingly, 
companies who specialised in microphones uh, could produce thousands of plastic mouldings and all sorts of accessories. So it was a difficult business to, to compete with. But we were approached by NRDC, National Research Development Council. They were sponsoring a group of, I have to say, boffins from the Oxford University Institute of Mathematics. Um, they'd invented the mathematics for sampling sound on the surface of a sphere to synthesise point source sampling. The big problem with microphones, with stereo microphones, is that if you have two capsules on a stereo microphone, you have two capsules like that, uh, in front of a, an orchestra or a choir, the sound arriving at one capsule and arriving at the next door capsule is slightly different. So as you get higher, it's all right at low frequencies, but if you get higher in frequencies, particularly anything above about seven or eight kilohertz, then you start to get cancellation effects and uh, it manifests itself as the image moving about or funny little comb effects, various things. So it's always a problem with stereo microphones. You can do as much as you can, but the actual diameter of the capsules is the thing that limits how close you can get them together. The smaller you make the capsules, the worse the performance of the microphone. You know, it's one of those things. However, the Soundfield microphone promised to get over all these problems. It used a tetrahedral array of capsules and the output of each capsule contributed towards a matrix that produced four synthetic outputs being three velocity components and a pressure component which could then be recombined to create any first order characteristic microphone pointing in any direction you wanted. So you could have a forward-looking cardioid, um, a, a pair of cardioids, uh, subcardioids, a uh, figure of eight, um, and do it all electronically, simply by varying the outputs of the thing. Because all of the capsules contributed an equal amount of signal to each of the four synthetic microphones, it meant that you could equalise um, for the pressure components and you could and the velocity components separately, which is a big problem with a, with a standard cardioid microphone. Uh, you can't do that. Whatever you do to to one thing, you're going to affect the other one. So when you when you combine all the signals together into a microphone, the effect of what I was describing, the spacing of the capsules, the effect of it is to produce a frequency response that rolls off uh, with increasing frequency. Um, and it's a very simple thing to do then, to equalise that and level it out. Um, and the, it, works in, it actually works in real life, that when you do that, you do not get any uh, spatial effects from the capsule. Not only that, you, because you can vary the angle, you because you can vary all of these components, you can electronically vary the angle of the capsules and by varying the forward component to the rearward component, you can zoom the microphone forward and you can zoom the microphone back and lift it up and down. And if you record all four signals, you can actually do it post-session because you've recorded the elements of the microphone rather than, uh, rather than, the, out than the synthesized stereo or mono. Uh, and therefore, you can combine everything to create any, any microphone after the session. So it seemed a great idea and they'd chosen Colorex, they'd looked at all the mi world's microphone manufacturers and they'd chosen our capsules because they were the least, they were the cleanest output um, because we weren't able to, m to actually mess about with them too much. Um, they were actually the best for doing this. It also, it also got rid of a lot of other problems because of the cancellation effects. It got rid of a lot of other little gremlins in capsule design and sorted them out at the moment. We worked on this for many years. We, we took a license out. Um, we discovered that the amount of work that had been done wasn't anything like as much as we thought it was. And it took a long, long time to get it to market. Uh, and eventually, this was, uh, this was one of the later ones. You have a control unit. 
um, where you can set the microphone level, that's capsule muting for testing, and th these are your controls, uh, which we call <coughs> azimuth, elevation, and dominance, dominance azimuth being um, has must be in tilt, dominance being the front and back, and then the capsule angle round here and the headphones output. So it all worked perfectly, and, and every large concert hall uh, bought them, but there aren't many of those. Um, and it turned out to be um, not the greatest of financial success. It's very difficult to, to make, a, um, make much money at it, to be honest. Uh, nowadays, it's not owned by Calric. Uh, the techno as part of a, a number of changes in the 80s, it ended up with a company in Wakefield um, called, and they now changed the name to Southfield, and it's now used uh, in addition to um, classic music recording. It's used for all the um, sports events for people like Sky because we're now doing 5.1 sound. Uh, Dolby 5.1 surround sound for broadcasting. What you actually need is a surround uh, microphone to pick up all the crowd and the ambience, uh, and the Soundfield microphone is ideal to do for that. You have to just uh, matrix it into um, a Dolby 5.1 format, um, so it, it, it's proved very popular with that. How am I doing time-wise? Uh, how am I doing? <coughs> That's what it looks like. So, in the 80s, that, was, that took us to the end of the 70s. In the 80s, we decided that microphones was great fun and a, a fantastic engineering challenge. And we learned all about physics and trying to develop a different RF microphone technique. We learnt all, we managed to reprove the second law of thermodynamics several times over, but which was great for me, it didn't make any money. Uh, so we decided to concentrate on mixer desks. They were large lumps. Um, for the amount of development on a microphone, you could, you could produce a huge amount of, in, of, of income from a mixing console. We invested in CAD facilities. Um, the output at Colrec, because everything was a new design and a new development, um, our output was always governed by how fast we could design printed circuit boards and how fast we could draw th circuits up. In the late 70s, we've been looking at the first available systems, but most were very primitive and underpowered. By a stroke of luck, we found an in-house system at Hewlett-Packard in, uh, in Scotland through a friend of ours who worked there. Um, they developed it for their own use. They had no intention of selling it. However, we pestered the sales team for a few months and eventually they relented. They sold us a copy of it and all the equipment to run it on. I say all. We got two monochrome graphics terminals, a text editor, a 20 megabyte hard disk that was it's like the size of a washing machine, uh, a backup tape that looked like something off an old James Bond film, and the first colour pen plotter that came into the UK all for a hundred thousand pounds. We had to borrow it all. It's about five hundred thousand pounds in today's money. It was the best decision we ever made. Not only did the design throughput go up by a factor of about five, uh, the density and the quality were hugely improved, which gave us a great advantage uh, over our competitors. We then, I'll, I'll skip through quickly, we then got into making um, music type consoles. This is a, uh, more like a music desk than a broadcast desk, but it's actually in Birmi Birm BBC Birmingham Radio Studio 3. The problem was that radio operators at BBC worked in recording studios at night, so they decided that they didn't want a boring old Colrec desk that looked like a, the broadcast equivalent of a Land Rover. They wanted something flashy and sexy and what have you. So we made uh, a desk that looked like a music studio desk, uh, and this studio then made the archers. It made the, ar made the archers, 
for 20 years did this, this mix in death, but it was very good. And it led on to greater things. We made a mix of death for ABBA, for their studio in Stockholm. Um, that's uh, um, another one in Denmark. I think that's where that's the finished thing. A great, when I talk about broadcasters, they all want the desks to be very small and compact and they can reach everything. Music studios want them to be as big as possible, to have as many lights on as possible so they can charge as much per hour as, as, as they can. Um, so that was that. Um, we, uh, we actually did one for... Um, Abbey Road in, uh, in London. There you can see our most famous sound operator. Um, it was quite interesting. We had a <coughs> we were invited by our MP to go down to the House of Commons. Uh, it was a, a, a few months after this had happened, um, to do a little presentation uh, for the Calder Valley technology. Um, we were in the gallery, long gallery, in, in the House of Commons, and it was reputed that Mrs T was coming round. We were about the 20 companies, we were down the middle. And so I rang the uh, studio manager, Abby Road. I said, have you got a picture of her when she visited? And he said, oh yeah. So he sent me this picture. So I had it blown up put on a stand. And uh, she came through the door at the end, scanned round, ignored the first 10 companies, walked straight to our little boom, and stood and told us, this is what's being told. We were being told for 10 minutes, she stood and told us how you do a multi track recording and mix down. And do you know, she knew that she knew, she whatever they told her at Abbey Road, she'd taken it all on board. She knew exactly how it worked. So, <laughs> we then, back to the con confines of space, um, for broadcasting, big consoles, numbers of channels needed is going up and up and up. Broadcasters no longer happy with 50 channels, which is about as much as you can reach comfortably. They wanted 100. So we, we decided to um, make, a, make a, an assignable console where, the, where there's a central control panel, which has mic input, gain control, equalization, dynamics, compressor limiter, expander, routine, which you assign on a channel-by-channel ch channel basis simply by pressing a button. <coughs> Brings the main control panel. Um, it means you can have, you get, rid of all the, uh, you get rid of all the electronics into a rack somewhere, and these can be very narrow, so these can be like 20 millimeters instead of 40 or 50 millimeters. Um, again, we had to do all the basic development work the uh, the controls, all the rotary controls, uh, they're all shaft encoders. There weren't any shaft encoders, we couldn't buy them. So we made them, so we made our own optical shaft encoders by printing um, a segmented display and fixing LEDs on it and making it all work. And things like that, we had to do all the, all the very basic stuff. Um, It didn't work very well, but it did teach us how it did teach us how not to go about it. We had to change all the electronics. Instead of having switches and faders, you had to use voltage controlled amplifiers, CMOS switches. It was a it was a whole different world and, 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 and in addition to that it had a it had a dreadful, dreaded microprocessor in it that we had to learn all about and start writing software um, and fathom out all how all that what was going to work. Um, but we did actually eventually sort it out, and by mid 80s, we de designed and built a large number. The audio is all in the racks. A large that's what a, that's a, 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 a plug in audio card. And we'd, by 1985, we'd built two very large consoles. These are the first two Thames Television at Teddington. It's still in service, is that one? Went in in 1985. Uh, and uh, a master sound control vehicle for BBC. So at that point, um, the company was very much an established company, um, <coughs> making products uh, not just in the uh, not just in the UK, but selling them all over the world. 
And at that point, I'll finish my talk. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.